the most audacious dream seekers of all will transform an agricultural suburb of Los Angeles into a place of myth and magic. The glamour capital of the world, Hollywood. It wasn't until 1904 that a street called Sunset Boulevard was built to link Los Angeles to a dusty little agricultural community named Hollywood. But before the end of the decade, a new industry would take root here that would give the word Hollywood a meaning far beyond a place on the map, the movies. At the beginning, short films were all that was being produced. Then in 1913, a New Yorker came on the scene who would change all that. His name was Cecil Blount DeMille. An actor and playwright, DeMille was a member of a distinguished theatrical family. Depressed by the failure of a Broadway play he had just directed, DeMille was commiserating with theatrical friends in New York when his fateful decision to create films was made. In a home filled with mementos of her grandfather and his career, Cece DeMille Presley remembers. DeMille was a failure in New York. He wanted to be an actor. He was going to go to Mexico to fight the war, and he was telling Jesse about it at lunch. Jesse Lasky and Sam, his best friend Goldfish, Goldwyn. And they said, my God, Cecil, you can't go there. You'll be killed. And they were trying to think of a way they could all go into business together. And somebody said, well, you know, there's a new art form. It's called motion pictures. Have you ever seen one? My grandfather said, no. And they said, well, look, there's one playing down here. Go look at it. So he went and saw the picture. And they all agreed they were going to make pictures. Lawyer Arthur Friend would join DeMille, Lasky, and Goldfish in the partnership. The partners had planned to film in Arizona, but bad weather there convinced them to continue by train to sunny Los Angeles. Here, a few fledgling directors had already discovered handy Southern California locations, like the missions, the oil fields, the coast, and the mountains. David Wark Griffith had arrived in 1910 and was successfully cranking out one reelers. Griffith would later be known for lavish and beautifully made creations, which are ranked as early film masterpieces. Max Sennett, a former actor like both DeMille and Griffith, took advantage of the wonderful natural light and Los Angeles locations to make his keystone comedies. But when DeMille and Lasky rented a barn in sleepy little Hollywood to serve as a studio, they were making history. For this film directed by DeMille would be the first feature length motion picture made here, The Squaw Man. DeMille, drawing on his Broadway experience, was the first to give billing to his star, stage actor Dustin Farnham, thereby setting a trend. A Western, The Squaw Man had an improbably absurd plot. Despite that, the film made for $15,000 grossed a quarter of a million. Hollywood and the movies had found each other. An energetic spirit infused these transplanted New Yorkers as they established permanent production facilities here. Experimenting with this developing medium, DeMille, sporting the jodhpurs, boots, and puttees that became his personal trademark, was creating a reputation as he discovered new cinematic techniques. He starred the world's reigning opera diva, Geraldine Farrar, in a film called Joan the Woman, in which he experimented with double exposure. His first historical spectacle, it boasted his first mob scenes. The main thing about shooting large groups of people with thousands of extras is that you must never show both the beginning and the end of the shot. And, of course, that makes sense.
If you never see the end or you never see the beginning, uh, then it's an infinite number. One of the best things about DeMel was that he really knew what the public wanted. His pictures were good movies, but they were what the public wanted to see. DeMel was noted for glamour. It was his trademark. The clothes, the, the lavish baths. He changed dress and plumbing all over the world. The sex scenes. DeMel had a lot of fun with sex in the movies. It was, it sold tickets, it was wonderful. Hollywood was changing too, growing up with the movies. It had already become a place of myth, as well as fact. And DeMille, with his uncanny instinct for what the public wanted, was leading the way. Hollywood had become a factory town. DeMille's former partner, Sam Goldfish, now Goldwyn, Jesse Lasky, and Adolf Zucker founded Paramount Pictures Corporation. Carl Lemley, a European-born ex-clothier, had founded Universal Studios, the first to have sound stages equipped with artificial lighting. Charles Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, and Mary Pickford, the greatest stars of their day, joined forces to form United Artists. In 1924, Goldwyn founded Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, perhaps the most successful studio in Hollywood history. Paramount, Warner Brothers, and Columbia all had huge lots and sound stages. By 1926, motion pictures became the fourth largest industry in the world. Films were the biggest business in California, grossing one and a half billion dollars a year and creating 90% of the world's films. The studio's finances were controlled from New York. Paramount, for example, built a 30-story building on Times Square from which it distributed several films a week to the 5,000 movie theaters in its empire. The major studios controlled distribution of their own films. Their Hollywood facilities were factories that cranked out product like Ford built automobiles. Their assembly lines overseen by talented artisans. Around them, the businesses that grew up all equaled one thing, glamorous Hollywood the capital of an industry that exported fantasies all over the world. And its uncrowned king was Cecil B. DeMille. A.C. Lyles has been a producer at Paramount for 60 years and met DeMille the day he first stepped on the lot. In Detroit, they make automobiles. Here, we make dreams. This is a dream factory. Paramount Studios is a dream factory. We put a dream on paper, we put it on film, and then send it out to an audience. DeMille had that tremendous ability to put the dream that he had on paper. Then he put it on film. And boy, did he do it. You townspeople over beyond the gate there, now, as these crusaders come riding through, work yourselves into, into the emotion of such a scene. Don't be extras. Be a nation, watching its manhood ride out on a great cause. Camera! that drew more to the audience than Cecil B. DeMille. His name was above the title, and that was box office. His name was box office. Mr. DeMille was one of the few men who invented the motion picture. They were making it all up. He had a hand in creating the art form of the 20th century and arguably the American art form, no question of it. And to have survived through the entire history of the movies up through uh, Ten Commandments was an extraordinary achievement. We, uh, we can't thank him enough. Directing a picture 
especially a large picture with physical dimensions uh, of some size, is like uh, landing a division on a hostile beach. It requires the same attention to communications, preparation, transportation, uh, alternate choices, weather, uh, and luck. The shooting, the costuming, everything else was a, a wonderful part of the process. But the idea itself, and how to put a simple idea that you might have had in a dream, or while reading a book, or while talking to somebody over a deck of cards, and having that dream come alive, that was what mattered to him. That was the best part of it. I owe him my career. I owe him everything. DeMille spent 46 years behind the cameras in a career that spanned the movies from their infancy through their maturity. The artistry of those pioneers created an art form, a mystique, a city, and a massive industry. Today, at over $21 billion annually, the film and television industry is California's biggest. Hollywood continues to attract new dream seekers like those who created it. In the years to come, Californians will take to the skies.